but it is a reminder again, as if we need it, uh, that these markets have this abusive relationship. The best way I can put it here, based on the prospects for a trade deal with China, uh, jumping when it looks good, uh, tumbling when it looks bad, even now taking it to uh, the president's often inconsistent musings on this subject. Nothing against him and what he's saying, but, uh, you know, he is yanking somebody's chain here on all of this because the markets go one way, then go another way on opinions and views that seem to change by the hour. And that is not sitting well with those who trade some of these big international stocks with ample exposure to that corner of the globe. Let's get the read on all of this and what we could be looking at with Speakerman Media President Lee Speakerman, Stanford School of Business Lecture Dave Dotson. Um, Dave, to you first then, uh, what is your take on the importance of whether the president got it wrong or not when it came to the Chinese making a call? The talks are still on for September, so should we just leave it at that? I actually think it's a pretty big deal, Neil, because if we can't even agree on whether a phone call took place, how are we possibly going to get a trade negotiation or a trade agreement together? I mean, think about the things. On Friday, the president of China is an enemy. On Monday, he's a great leader. On Tuesday, we're arguing about whether a phone call was being made or not. We are so far away from having a trade agreement. And this is from the person who's the master of deal making. Now, look, we made two catastrophic errors. I'm all in favor of trying to level the playing field and making sure that China's unfair trade practices are put to rest. But we've made two catastrophic errors. The first one is we decided to fight a trade war with everybody all at once <coughs> instead of pulling the rest of the countries together and fight a united front against China because our beef with China is the same beef that other countries have. The second thing is this erratic behavior with the business community. You know, at one level you could say it's annoying, it's frustrating, we'll get through it once we have a trade agreement, everything will be fine. That's not the real problem, I think, Neil. The real problem I see is this, is that Donald Trump is on the verge of losing the support of the business community, not Wall Street, not the investment world, but the guy who is the supply chain manager at John Deere or at Home Depot who has to make decisions. This is getting very frustrating for the business environment because they don't know whether the China is an enemy or a great leader or not. And once he loses the support of business, China can wait us out because they know they can make it to November 2020. Now, uh, Lee, you are... Uh, the different point of view here, but I did want to ask you whether the president risks jumping the shark on this, uh, trying to re-exercise the Emergency Powers Act, I, I believe during the Carter years of 1977, that would block companies' actions, in this case, uh, dealing with China. Uh, that is where, to the professor's point, the president might have alienated his base of business interests who like pretty much everything else he's done when it comes to tax cuts, regulatory relief, that he could be killing that relationship with, with just that proposal. What do you think? Well, I think, first of all, President Trump's real base uh, are working people, the workers in those uh, states like Wisconsin, uh, Pennsylvania, Ohio, uh, that had been voting Democratic, voted for Barack Obama. That is his base, not Wall Street and, and these other businesses. Uh, American business is very important. Uh, but uh, I disagree with Dave. Uh, the issue is not just China. We have a $70 billion goods trade deficit with Japan, Germany, Germany and Mexico, uh, 60 to 70 billion, actually even more with Mexico. Uh, so, uh, you know, we can't just unite against China. Now, China is the worst. Well, we it's have a good a thing because he's fighting with everyone, Lee, right? He's worst. fighting with everybody, and that's the, the problem. Because Wouldn't the, you want to the pick entire and world your is the world is upside down, and President Trump is correct when he said we've been the world's piggy bank. Uh, we cannot afford the paradigm for trade is terrible for America, hosing American workers from almost every country in the world, unfortunately. So the way to simplify it, I do agree with Dave on this. We do need to make it clear what our plan is and where we're going. Let's do what we did with pickup trucks back in the 1960s. Impose a, we imposed a 25 percent tariff on all pickup truck imports. And look what's happened. The three top selling vehicles in the United States are pickup trucks. So they're very affordable by the middle class. The Asian pickup truck manufacturers make their trucks here in the United States, employing thousands of well-paid workers with full benefits, making great incomes. That's great for middle-class America and for American workers. Let's announce that we're going to have a 15 percent uniform tariff on all imported goods well, well, from let's stick all to, countries. Let's stick to that keeps no, let's it stick simple. to reality right now and what we're dealing with right now. And professor, that is reality. It could be reality. Yeah, but it's not right now. So, Professor, it, I'm it, looking it at— 
I'm telling you, it's not happening right now. So, Professor, what I'd like to ask you is this. The <laughs> president by... Boy, oh boy. The, pre the president is saying right now, Professor, that right now Xi Jinping is a brilliant man. Last week he was sort of like on our enemies list along with the chairman of the Federal Reserve. I'm just right. wondering whether he is imperiling his own chances of success by blowing up his own progress. I think he is. And, and you know, you think about, uh, Lee, you mentioned uh, states like you know, Wisconsin and Ohio, you got to get out there and visit them because those soybean farmers are getting slaughtered. And it's not just temporary because what's happening as a result of this trade war, which is being mishandled, is that capacity, for, for example, for soybean capacity is being expanded in Russia and Kazakhstan and Brazil. And that capacity is not going to go away. Those farmers are going to get decimated. And you're right, Lee, that is Donald Trump's base. And he's going right after them and he's hurting them permanently. Um, in terms of how he's handling this trade war, what he needs to be doing is he needs to be sending a very clear signal to business that this is the progression that we're going to take and we're going to escalate it if certain things don't happen. But the erratic behavior is what's been so frustrating for business. And that's that, that's what we have to address. And in terms of the 15 percent across the board tariff, look, I agree, of course, that jobs have been lost in the United States. But we have Three this bad habit. Million. We've had Three this bad habit. Million. We've had this bad habit for almost we've had this bad habit for almost a generation of blaming our problems on everybody else. The fact is, it's not everybody else's problem that we have an opioid crisis mm -hmm. that has reduced uh, mortality. It's not everyone else's fault that our education system has crumbled. We call it the Rust Belt for a reason. And you go to China and you look at the area above uh, um, uh, Hong Kong in the Shanghai region where they've invested in infrastructure. Those are the kinds of things that make you productive. We cannot tariff our way back to being productive. We have Excuse to look me, inward, Dave, but and we have this to fix began, our own problems. Go ahead, Lee. Dave, the, the pro it is our own problem. Dave, this began in the 1980s, early 80s and late 70s, when we allowed sh Japan to dump steel in the U.S. That began the massive deindustrialization of the American heartland. And then China took the book from Japan and put it on steroids. And they have been dumping goods into this country. Yes, we can tariff our way back to a level playing field because tariffs are what enabled us to build our mighty industrial economy for most of our history. Our founding fathers, Abraham Lincoln, all believe strongly in tariffs. But Lee, it was Lee, Republican Lee, Party you make, a, you make well a very good argument century. for that. Lee, you're very consistent on that. Do you worry that the president is and all it's over simple. the map? simple. Yeah, it might be, but I'm just telling you, the president's all over the map. I know every time you come on what you're going to say. I, I admire that. I'm telling you, the president's all over the map on this. And he doesn't, needs to I be don't simple think he knows say what he a, believes. Well, well, I think I, he knows what he believes. Lee, Lee, I would say this to you. First of all, the problem with doing across the board tariffs is what are you going to tell your natural gas industry in Texas when they can't export because they're not competitive? What are you going to tell the farmers in Iowa or Wisconsin? Dave, we or have Ohio an $800 so, wait, billion let me dollar let goods me finish, trade Lee, deficit. Lee, let me finish. We have Lee, an eight, well, wait Lee, a minute. We have finish. an $800 Lee, billion dollar goods trade deficit. You know, you so can't, that, you can't, you can't pick and choose way. individual. You can't interrupt your way right, into being professor, right. Professor, make that point. You're, you, you're saying what? Okay. But, but you're leaving off an important number, Dave. There's, Lee, I'll give you a chance. There are sectors of the economy that would be seriously hurt by this across-the-board tariff. The second thing sectors. is that if you do an across-the-board, let me please let me finish. If you do an across-the-board tariff, what you're basically saying is, look, we can just tweet our way into productivity. Uh, and the rest of the countries will respond, and they will respond in kind. And this sort of static analysis that we do a tariff, and then all of a sudden the whole world is going to come to their knees and, and, and surrender to us, is not how the real world works. And if you want evidence of that, look at what we've done for the last two years. We went to China, and we tweeted some tariffs, and expected they were going to come to their knees, and they have responded, as has the rest of the world. And that sort of dynamic process is what happens in trade negotiations. Lee, right. I appreciate that maybe around Lincoln's time, this would have worked, but today the world's way more well, complex. Well, I covered it during Lincoln's time, and it didn't work. But I, I, let me. All right, Lee, quick answer to that. We've already picked up thirty billion dollars in additional tariff revenue. We, if we had a fifteen percent uniform tariff, talk about a static oh, analysis. This free trade drivel that has been lapped up by most of the media, unfortunately, and a lot of business people, uh, is ridiculous. The truth is that we would gain three trillion dollars in government revenue with a 15% tariff on goods imports. Do you think China's paying imports. that 30 billion, billion dollars over no, no, the next no, Lee, decade? Do you think China's paying that 30 billion? 
I think it is attached to the goods, and indirectly they are, because first of all, a lot of their companies are going to just not uh, compress so, margins just and cut so. costs you dearly, to make up for it. Lee, you're double counting. Guys, I wish we had one more time. Excuse me, one second. Excuse me, Neil. Look at the time we have to go. We're going to have more after this.